All right, so here is another Mrs. T's Chem Talk Regions Review. This one is going to be on the reference tables on periodic table. So hopefully this will give you everything you need to know about the periodic table. So first of all, if we look at the periodic table, we can see that it is organized. And the first thing that we're going to talk about is a little bit about how it's organized. So if we look here, first thing to note is that hydrogen is over here, but hydrogen is not a metal. So it's on the metal side, but it's not a metal. So if we look at the elements on the periodic table, here is our division, this staircase over here. This side, we have metals, including these guys down here. And over here, we have our non-metals and hydrogen is also a non-metal. So that's the first division. Second thing that you should keep in mind is that if we look, two things that we can usually look at are francium and fluorine because francium is our most active metal and fluorine is our most active nonmetal. So if we want to know about the properties of a metal or the properties of a nonmetal, we're going to look at francium to see what metals act like on table S and fluorine to see what nonmetals act like on table S. We can look up ionization energies, electronegativities, and things like that to determine how metals and nonmetals tend to act. We have some different groups. Uh, group one, remember, first of all, that our groups are the columns. They're also called families. And that group one is known as the alkali metals. Group two is known as the alkaline earth metals. From three to 11, we have transition metals, which again, remember that includes the lanthanides and the actinides. If I could spell transition metals down here too. Uh, when we get to 13, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, they don't really have names. Sometimes we just call this the carbon group, the nitrogen group, the oxygen group. Group 17, are the halogens, and group 18, including helium, are the noble gases. So all of the members of group 18 are in the gas state at STP. Um, as a note, our other gases on the table are nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine, and hydrogen. So those are our gases, the ones that tend, uh, that are gases at STP. Sometimes they ask about that. So everybody in group 18, plus hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine. Now, knowing that, we also have uh, anybody who touches the staircase here in two places, except for aluminum and not polonium. These are our metalloids or our semi-metals. So these elements have properties of metals and properties of non-metals. We also know if we want to go back to the transition elements, the transition metals from groups 3 to 11, these are the ones that tend to make colorful ions in aqueous solutions. So for example, um, cobalt tends to make blue ions, copper can be blue or green, iron sometimes is reddish, and the different elements, um, chromium in ions can be, in, can be yellow or orange. And the different elements in groups 3 to 11 tend to make colorful ions. Um, if we look down here, notice that this is element 57. This is where 58 through 71 are shown. Those are called the lanthanide series. This is element 89. And down at the bottom here, we can see elements 90 to 103. So those uh, continue down at the bottom. When we're looking at the periodic table also, we have um, our key here. I think I have that on the next page. So 
So if we look at the key for the periodic table, we have uh, some different things that we can look at. This and the top for every element is the atomic mass. Remember that this is an average and it is a weighted average. It's a weighted average of all of the naturally occurring isotopes. This is the one where we do the mass and AMUs times the percentage abundance for all the naturally occurring isotopes. And we do mass times percent, mass times percent for as many isotopes as there are. And then we add it up and that's where that number comes from. We have our symbol for each element. We have the atomic number which the atomic number is the number of protons, and I can't spell apparently. Um, the atomic number is the number of protons, and this number of protons will be equal to the sum of the electron configuration because on the periodic table we are representing atoms in the ground state, which means, remember the word atom, means neutral, so in an atom, the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons because protons have a plus one and electrons have a minus one charge. We also remember when we're talking about these masses up here, these are the masses for the different naturally occurring isotopes. And when we're talking about isotopes, those are atoms of the same element so that means they have the same numbers of protons, but different numbers of neutrons. So for example, we can have carbon 12 and carbon 14. And as we said on table O video, when you subtract the mass number minus the atomic number, you get the number of neutrons. So in this case, carbon-14 has eight neutrons, where carbon-12 only has six neutrons. Some other things to note on the periodic table would be that we have our selected oxidation states. Remember, this is used in redox. This is not an exhaustive list, but this is going to be a selected set of oxidation numbers. Mm -hmm. So this means that there could be some that have been left off of the table. We also have a note that relative atomic masses are based on the fact that carbon-12 equals 12 exact. That means that one atomic mass unit equals exactly 1 12th the mass of carbon-12. Okay, exactly 1 12th the mass of one atom of carbon-12 is how an, an AMU is defined. Moving forward, we also note that here, where this was a little... Um, Zoom in. Again, every element has their oxidation numbers, their atomic mass, their atomic number, and their electron configuration. So that was just a little close-up look of that. We went over this already. Uh, I also wanted to point out that at the bottom of the table, that we have an asterisk here. And it says that there is an asterisk, and it's on element number 72. There is actually a 2,8 for the electron configuration for every element, element 72 and above. That means any of the configurations that you see that start with 18 really have a 2,8 in front of them. And as we spoke about in class, this is for hafnium. If we put a 2,8 in front of all of them, it would not have fit. So there is actually a missing part of their electron configurations in order to have it fit. And the second asterisk is just telling us that the elements for 113 and above with those U, U letters, they're just telling us that they were um, they will be used until we uh, the IUPAC approves other names. And remember that the IUPAC is just really, we always say that's just the way we name things in chemistry. And it's the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemists, or International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. So going back for a second also, just some note of some trends that we see on the periodic table. If we're talking about electronegativity, and we're talking about ionization energy, 
as we go across a period, these are both going to increase because electronegativity measures the pull or the hold on the electrons by the nucleus of an atom, and it also measures the attraction for electrons in a bond with another atom, and ionization energy is going to measure the amount of energy it takes to remove the most closely bound electron from an atom or the most tightly bound electron from an atom. As we go across a period, if we're staying in one single period, like let's say period four, every element in period four has four shells of electrons. They have an equal amount of shielding. However, potassium has 19 protons, calcium has 20, scandium has 21, then we go to 22 and on and on and on until we get to krypton and bromine where bromine has 35 protons pulling and krypton has 36 protons pulling. We call that number of protons nuclear charge. So if we take the positive in front of the number of protons, that's our nuclear charge. Potassium has a nuclear charge of positive 19. Bromine has a nuclear charge of positive 35. That increase in nuclear charge will allow the elements on the right-hand side of the table to hold on to the electrons tighter than the elements on the left-hand side of the table in the same period. So going across a, per uh, going across a period, the ionization energy and electronegativity will both tend to generally increase because of an increasing nuclear charge. Now as we go down a group, we are increasing the number of shells of electrons. So in any given group, we will see the atomic radius increase as we go down because of the increased number of shells but we'll also see the pull for the nucleus on the outermost electrons decrease because these extra shells cause what's, uh, cause what's called the shielding effect. So as we go down, even though we're having more and more protons, those protons have layers of electron shells in their way. So the nucleus can't do as good of a job holding on to the electrons in period five as it can do for an element in period one because these extra shells of electrons are going to shield the nucleus and shield the electrons from the pull of the nucleus. So as we go down a group, we're going to have a bigger atomic radius, but we're also going to have a decrease in the electronegativity and the ionization energy. And one thing I missed on the way across, we are going to actually have a smaller atomic radius as we go across because having the same number of shells but again, having an increasing nuclear charge will help to pull those electrons in the same number of shells in closer to the nucleus. So going across the period, we have higher ionization energy and higher electronegativity, but smaller radius. Going down a group, we have larger radius, but smaller or lower electronegativity and lower ionization energy and this again is due to the number of shells going down the group is due to shells or shielding across a period is due to nuclear charge of course though when we do our video on table s you'll be able to um, check on the changes across a period or down a group for electronegativity ionization energy and atomic radius because all of those values are actually listed on table s so hopefully this was a helpful review of some of the things that show up on the periodic table. Just wanted to make sure I went through all the different slides that I wanted to. And we, uh, I hope to see you back because I will do more videos on Mrs. T's Chem Talk. Um, I will do more videos on the reference table. So please check back because there'll be another video for table S and table T. And if you haven't already seen them, there are also videos for the other tables on the reference tables. Happy studying.